a, a little bit meta about how we evaluate technology, but I will look at some specific technologies as well. But uh, it's kind of give you a bit of a framework that you can apply maybe when you're listening to some of the other talks um, this evening. Um, but I thought I'd start by showing you some code. Is that okay? Who wants to see some code? Yes? Okay. Some code. Uh, this is code. This is a picture of code. Uh, this code base is deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. And this is actually a photograph of DNA, a photograph of code. It's the famous photograph 51 that was taken by Rosalind Franklin, the X-ray crystallographer. Uh, she did amazing work, and it was thanks to her work and her research that we could actually begin to crack the code of DNA. It's base 4, so unlike binary that we work with with computers, which is base 2, this is base 4, right? Um, but with this base 4 uh, code base, we get all life on planet Earth. We get every single human being, every single bird, every single fish, every single insect, all sharing the same simple code base. Now, it's an amazing process that has led to this, the, the process of evolution through natural selection, right? This incredible variety of life, all of them highly evolved. We like to think sometimes that human beings are the most highly evolved species, but the truth is every species on the planet is the most highly evolved species for its environment. That's why it's still around. So uh, evolution through natural selection is an amazing process, but it's slow. It's slow and it's a little messy because it relies on errors, right? Errors get selected for over time. And one thing we have managed as human beings is we've managed to find a way to sort of uh, hack the process, a way to get a jump on evolution through natural selection. And that's through technology. Instead of you know, waiting and selecting for errors to evolve, say, a sharp cutting tool at the end of a limb, we instead create a sharp cutting tool and we augment ourselves with this technology. So this is a, an early example of technology in a Schwalian hand axe. And these were all over the planet for, for many thousands of years. And yeah, we were able to augment ourselves, right? We shape our tools and then the sh tools shape us. And that's pretty, mean, pretty much been the story of technology ever since. Here's a more modern example of technology, one of my favorites, the pencil, again, found all over the planet. Um, it's a great piece of design. It's got this very clear affordance, you know which bit you're supposed to use. It has a built-in progress bar. Um, <laughs> And it has undo, so <laughs> great piece of technology. What's, what's interesting about the pencil, and I think this is typical of literally any technology we build today, is that it requires cooperation, right? It's no, there's a great book, it's called I Pencil by Leonard Reed, and it's told from the point of view of a pencil. And the whole point of the book is to say that no human being can make a pencil, no single human being. When you think about getting the graphite and the wood and putting it all together and that whole process, it requires cooperation. And that's pretty much true of any technology. That sort of the price we pay for technology is that we must cooperate. We get that you know, uh, economy of scale. And you can try to make technology by yourself, but you're going to have a hard time. There was an artist in England called Thomas Twaits, and he had a project called the Toaster Project where he tried to make a toaster from scratch. Like, literally, he wanted to do everything himself. He wanted to smelt the metals. He wanted to make the plastic and do the wiring. Uh, it didn't really work, uh, and it was prohibitively expensive. But all of these examples of technology, whether it's a Schwalian hand axes or pencils or toasters or anything you care to think of, it generally falls into this pattern, right? That you've got a human being augmenting themselves using hardware. Okay, So you've got the human, you've got the hardware. But something interesting happened in the 20th century when we got something in between, and that was software, where now the human could interact with the software, and it's the software that then interacts with the hardware. Um, a really good example of this from the 20th century, I think, would be something like the Apollo landings, right? getting to the moon. It required amazing human beings, yes, but it also required uh, amazing hardware, the most powerful rocket ever built to this day is the Saturn V rocket, and amazing software that Margaret Hamilton wrote for the onboard uh, system of Apollo. So it's a classic example of these three things working together, humans, software, and hardware. And sort of ever since then, I've seen a bit of a trend, which is that of these three layers, the hardware is starting to fade a bit. And what's becoming more and more important over time is the software. There's this idea of ubiquitous computing, that, that the hardware literally, you know, design dissolving into behavior, that we don't even think about the hardware, that the hardware becomes irrelevant. 
And that goal, that idea of hardware becoming irrelevant, in a way, was what was driving Tim Berners-Lee when he invented the World Wide Web. He was working at CERN, this amazing place, this cathedral of science uh, underneath the Swiss-French border. Uh, we've got these amazing people collaborating together. It's a fantastic place. But they're all using different systems. And there's, it's, there's no hierarchy at CERN, so everybody's using different, different kind of computers. So in order to enable collaboration there, you kind of needed to make the hardware irrelevant, right? So that people could collaborate and share information. And that's where we got the World Wide Web. And the World Wide Web as a technology is this, this classic example of building on what's come before, right? There's things that are built on the web that couldn't exist without the web, right? You know, we can't have Twitter or Facebook or any of these things without first having the web, but you can't have the web without first having the internet. And you don't get to have the internet without first having computers, and that means you need electricity, that means you need industrialization. So we're always building on what's come before. Um, the author Stephen Johnson talks about this idea of the adjacent possible, right? That the, you, uh, enough steps need to be in place for something to be created. So you can't invent a, a microwave oven in medieval Europe because not enough steps have happened yet to make microwave ovens uh, possible. But, so you're always building what comes before. And in the World Wide Web project itself, that's true even of the pieces of it. So if you think of what the World Wide Web is, it's basically agreements, right? It's protocols. You've got the hypertext transfer protocol, URLs as identifiers, and then this very simple format of HTML, at least very simple to begin with. And each one of these building blocks was built on something that already existed. So HTTP is built on top of the internet, so TCP IP. URLs use the domain name system that was already in place. And HTML, this markup format, was built on a format that was already in use at CERN. The scientists at CERN were already writing documents in a format called SGML. In fact, if you were to look at the flavor of SGML that they were using back then at CERN, you would have seen elements like this. These are all from CERN SGML, right? H1, H2, title. Oh. So Tim Berners-Lee literally took it wholesale. He just copied those elements and put them into HTML. That meant people would start using this technology straight away because it was familiar to them. In fact, you were able to take a CERN SGML document and just change the file extension to .html, and it would, it would work in a web browser. So obviously, we got a lot more elements over time. I think the very first version of HTML, like version 0, was like 21 elements. But ever since then, we've been adding to it and getting more richness to the language. So we got a lot of um, more semantic richness with these kind of elements that allow us to structure our information better. But where it gets really interesting for us, I think, is when we have the sort of magical elements that come with behaviors attached, right? The ability to play video and audio, have responsive images, and do interactive graphics with Canvas, right? Very powerful things. Now, the, each one of these elements have been designed in a, in a certain way so that you could put fallback content in between the opening and closing tags, right? So if you use a, a video element, you can put uh, something in between the opening and closing video tags for the browsers that don't support video. Or if you use Canvas, you can put something between the opening and closing tags for the browsers that don't support Canvas. And that's not an accident. That is very much by design. In fact, there are design principles behind HTML, and that's a core tenet of design principles, that these new powerful features um, should also come with some means of providing a, a, a fallback, which I think brings up a, an interesting way to approach technology. Because what we tend to do when we're evaluating technology is the first thing we do is we say, well, well how well does it work? Right? How well does this piece of technology work? And that's a completely fair question. But I don't think it's the most important question. I think it's more important to ask, how well does it fail? Right? How well does the technology fail? And all of those HTML elements we saw there, they fail really well because they've been designed to fail well. There are design principles making sure they fail well. So I'll give you an example of that. Let's apply this question. How, how well does it fail? Let's apply that to some web technologies. So um, let's look at some CSS, like uh, CSS shapes. Is anybody using CSS shapes? OK, excellent. Um, what you might do if you're thinking of using the CSS, you might go to caniuse.com. And you plug it in, and you see, well, what's the browser support like? This is kind of asking, how well does it work? And you'll see some green, and you see some red. Some browsers support it, some browsers don't. Um, 
but that doesn't tell you how well it fails, right? When you see a browser doesn't support it, that doesn't tell you what happens in that situation. So asking the question, how well does it fail, is more important here. So an example, here's, here's uh, CSS Shapes uh, working. This is a browser that supports CSS Shapes. I'm using Shape Outside Circle, and that's why this text is curving around the circular image, right? So uh, Shape Outside, colon, circle, and we get this, this effect. Fine, that's how it works, but how well does it fail? Well, here it is in a browser that doesn't support CSS shapes. You simply get this straight line, as though you'd never applied the property in the first place. So I think that fails really well. So even though there's browsers that don't support this, I'm going to go ahead and use it because it fails really well. Okay? So let, let's apply that to some more technologies. Let, let's ask the same question of some more technologies. What about service workers? Who's heard of service workers? All right, lots of people heard of it. Who's using service workers? All right, a few, few fewer hands. So the rest of you, you've heard about it, but you're not using it yet. That means you're evaluating the technology. And you might ask, well, how well does it work? Um, works pretty well. You can do really cool stuff with service workers, like you can have your website still work even when people are offline, which is incredibly powerful. You can have all sorts of performance benefits. It's a really weird technology to get your head around. It's like the user visits your site you know, for the first time, and there's no service worker, it doesn't exist yet, and then the service worker gets installed on their machine, almost like a, a cookie, but that can execute scripts. So it's like a virus, uh, but a good kind of virus. So it's like you're doing a man-in-the-middle attack on your own website. Um, <laughs> So it's really, really powerful, uh, but you have, to, you, know, you have to work at it. You have to get to grips with it. Um, so how does it work? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, once you, once you, you know, get to grips with it, there's no magic behavior that comes with service workers. You have to tell it exactly what you want to do. Uh, fine. Um, you might look at Can I Use and see what the browser support is like. And then again, you know, there's some browsers support it, some browsers don't. But as we saw with the CSS Shapes example, this doesn't tell us what we need to know. Just knowing that some browsers don't support it doesn't answer the question, how well does it fail? So how well do service workers fail? They fail really well. In fact, I think that's the genius of the design of service workers, is that when I was describing the way service workers work, the first time someone visits your site, there is no service worker, right? Because they haven't visited your site yet. Therefore, the first time someone visits your site, no browsers support service worker. Right? It's only on repeat visits that, that you can use the power of service workers. And that means you have to use service workers as an enhancement to what you've already got. You must be providing a fallback, otherwise people could never visit your site in the first place. And I think that's genius. That kind of means even if service workers were only supported in one browser, it would still make sense to use it. The point here is that the lack of support for service workers doesn't do any harm in those browsers. Right? If you use service workers, you are not harming the browsers that don't support service workers. So it's kind of win-win. I think service workers are a really good example of a technology that fails well. All right, let's look at another technology on the web. Web components. Who's, who's heard of web components, first of all? Okay, quite a few hands. Who's using web components, the real thing now? Wow, actual web components? Wow, impressive. Um, yeah, web components are pretty fascinating technology. Well, just because the support, right? I mean, the browser support. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so web components are not really a technology. It's kind of this umbrella term for a bunch of technologies. Like you've got uh, custom elements and other specs like the very sinister sounding shadow DOM. Um, and there's other things. There's templates. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Templates. What, what am I saying wrong here? No? no. no? I mean, there's a headache. Hmm? <laughs> there's a headache for developers. There's a what now? No, no, no. Am I saying something incorrect here? Web components is an umbrella technology that consists of custom elements, templates. It's a developer's head. Developer's head. Okay. Right. Should I continue or? You should, because if you want to, if you want to talk about web components. Okay. Good. So you've tried web components and you never want to try it again. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I want us to cite. Okay. Fair enough. So web components. Just to, I, I'm not going to go into the code because that would bring back flashbacks here and we don't want, <laughs> we don't want to do that. But just to, 
So to briefly explain what the idea behind Web of Components is that um, when we're looking at the powerful elements that we get in HTML, right, the sort of interactive behavioral ones, they're great, but they take time to get into browsers, right, because there's a whole process of standardization to make sure we're doing them correctly. In a way, this is like the process of evolution through natural selection, right? These, they get selected for, it takes time, and eventually they land in the web browsers. And that's great, but the idea with uh, web components is you just make them up. You just create your own elements, create your own behavior, and put them on the web. Um, so you, you just come up with new elements by yourself. Uh, the only sort of caveat is that your tag name must include a hyphen. This is kind of an agreement between developers and browser makers that there won't ever be a future HTML element that ever has a hyphen in it. Um, okay, fine, but you know, if you, if you put these on, on a website now, they would just be like span elements, right? So there's all these other things you have to plug in to get the behavior you want. But the really nice thing is that the behaviors and the stylings of these custom elements are scoped to those elements. So you don't get the styles of the behaviors leaking out. That's the theory anyway, right? Um, so it sounds great. It sounds like a wonderful dream world we all want to live in. I mean, in a way, this is what we're chasing after with things like React components and, and pattern libraries and this idea of encapsulation and modularity. Well, how well does it work? Like I said, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of different specs that fall under this web components umbrella. And if you look at the support for the different specs, yeah, you know, some sort of green, some red. But as we saw by looking at CSS shapes and by looking at service workers, this doesn't tell us the whole story, right? Just because some browser doesn't support the spec doesn't, doesn't mean we don't use the spec, right? Because what we have to ask is, how well does it fail? And that's where it gets interesting with web components. How well do web components fail? Because the answer is, it depends. It depends entirely on how you use the web component, how you design your custom element. So let's say you make a custom element, like this image gallery example, it's going to be a, a swishy, wonderful carousel, and you've got the images that go in it inside the opening and closing tags, and then you add in the behavior and the styling to make it you know, animated and smooth and wonderful, great. But let's say a browser doesn't support custom elements, well, the user still gets the images, right? They still get what they came for, which is the images. They don't get the fancy behavior, but they get something. So this is very similar to the design of the HTML elements. There is a fallback provided. So if you do this with web components or something like this, web components fail really well. However, what I tend to see when I look at examples of web components on the web, I tend to see stuff like this. Just an opening tag, closing tag, and that's it. And all of the powerful stuff is, is off in the JavaScript. And if the browser doesn't even support custom elements, tough luck, right? There's even, I mean, um, Google have a, a, a library called Polymer, which is a library of, of web components. And they've got demos of this working. They've even built a whole shop online to show uh, Polymer and web components in action. And this is literally the source of that, of that document, is that there's an opening shop app and a closing shop app, and then everything's inside the script, right? So there's... Whoa. There is no, there's no fallback here. So in this situation, that particular web component fails really badly, right? So it depends. The answer to how well web components work is it depends on how you design the use of those web components. No? You can go there, view source. Hmm? You can, okay. I'm telling you, you can go there, you can view source, this is what you will see. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll get, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll, get this, I'll get this off the screen in a moment so you don't have to look at it. I remember your face. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring back bad memories here. You didn't make this, though. You didn't make this particular. Okay, good, good. Anyway, so my point here is it depends, right? It depends how you use it. And maybe we need to have design principles in the same way that the HTML standard has design principles. Um, the, the really exciting thing about web components is that it gives us developers the same power that previously only browser makers had. But the really scary thing about web components is that it gives us developers the same power that previously only browser makers had. Right? So we need to match that, that power with responsibility. Um, but whenever you're evaluating any technology, you know, whether it's in the browser or, or otherwise, I think another question to ask is who benefits? Who benefits from this technology? Um, 
like look at the website for the thing that's being sold to you and see like, you know, what, who's, who, who's being sold this technology? Where are the benefits lying? I think on the web, we tend to have benefits falling into these two camps. Either it's really beneficial to developers or really beneficial to users. And now to be fair, most technologies are for both, right? It's beneficial to developers, it's beneficial to users, everybody wins. But there are some times when you might have to choose. There's a technology that's really beneficial to developers, but the user pays a cost, or vice versa. Like I would say, for example, service workers that we were looking at earlier are really beneficial to users because you get the offline experience, you get performance gains, right? But we developers, we have, now we have to learn service workers, right? We've got to learn a whole new technology and understand how it works. So, so there's, there's a, a benefit to users at the expense of developers. Now, personally, I'm willing to pay that price. I think I would always choose the user over the developer. I think that's kind of what my job is, right? Um, when it comes to, to, to deciding things, it's like actually a great design principle from the HTML design principles called the priority of constituencies. And it says, in case of conflict, consider users over authors over implementers over theoretical purity. So consider users, that's the end users, over authors, that's us, over implementers, that's Firefox and all the other browsers, over theoretical purity. I actually think that's a pretty good list of priorities, right? But at the same time, when we're evaluating the technologies we use, I think we need to make a distinction between the kinds of technologies we're talking about. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of what I mean. There's a whole bunch of technologies that I kind of consider like the inward-facing technologies because they sit on our computers, right? So these are the technologies that help us work better. Version control systems, you know, um, transpilers, um, preprocessors, postprocessors, all these things. They sit on our computers, and what they spit out at the end is they'll always still CSS, HTML, JavaScript, right? And when it comes to evaluating these kind of inward-facing technologies, my reaction is, well, use whatever works for you, because these don't affect the, the end user directly. Now, you could make the argument that anything that helps a developer work faster is therefore going to be better for the end user, but I'm talking about directly, directly impacting the end user. So when it comes to evaluating these inward-facing technologies, use whatever you like is my attitude, right? Because it doesn't matter to the end user. But I don't think we can apply that same criteria when we're evaluating the outward-facing technologies. These are the technologies that the end user kind of needs to install for us to get the benefit. CSS frameworks, JavaScript libraries, right? So CSS frameworks are written in CSS, and JavaScript libraries are written in JavaScript. And so for us to get the benefit of these tools, the user has to pay a tax by downloading those tools. Now, interesting, a lot of the JavaScript libraries are sort of now straddling both worlds because you can do the whole server-side rendering so you get to use them more as inward-facing tools and not have the user pay that tax of that download. That's an interesting progression that's happened. But in general, I think we just need to have different criteria in our heads when we're evaluating these kind of tools to when we're evaluating these kind of tools. Here, use whatever you like, whatever works for you. Whatever works for your team, I guess, is the most important thing. But here, stop and consider the end user. And there's all sorts of questions you've got to ask when you're deciding on whether you're going to use a, a CSS framework or a JavaScript library or something like that. You've got to see, you know, what's the, uh, what's the browser support like? That's really important. What's the file size like? You know, how much of a download is the user going to have to download? Um, what's the community like? Will I get answers to my questions if I need help? And those are all really, really important questions, yes, but not the most important question, I think. I think when you're evaluating those kind of technologies, the most important question to ask is, what are the assumptions? What are the assumptions that have been baked into the technology? And sometimes those assumptions are very clear, maybe because there's design principles in the case of HTML, and you can see the assumptions written out. But sometimes the assumptions aren't obvious. Sometimes the creators of the technology might not even realize the assumptions are there. That's why they're assumptions, right? But I guarantee you they are there, because technology comes with assumptions because technology is made by humans and we can't help it, right? Software, like all technologies, is inherently political. Code inevitably reflects the choices, biases, and desires of its creators, right? Now, I'm not saying we're bound to the technology, that we can't use technology for different means than what it was invented for, that's possible, but you just need to be aware of what, where those assumptions are, right? Technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral.
Kranzberg's uh, first law. I mean, a lot of time when I hear talk about technology, I don't mean browser technologies. Now I'm talking about the stuff out in the world, you know, the, the drones and the self-driving cars and the AI and all that, those hot topics. It seems like there's this almost uh, inevitability, right? This stuff is coming and there's nothing you can do about it. It's the future, take it. Um, and I always feel kind of disempowered by that. I feel like, and there is even a school of thought that technology is the driver of history, this idea of technological determinism. Uh, it makes me uncomfortable. There's an author, uh, Kevin Kelly, and he writes, he writes books that sound like they're full of technological determinism, like, you know, what technology wants and the inevitable, right? He's, but actually, he makes a more subtle point. I mean, first he points out that the technologies don't, don't wipe out what comes before. They don't, don't replace what's come before, that they exist side by side. Um, he, he makes the claim that no technology has ever gone ex extinct, which sounds crazy, but you try and find a technology that's gone extinct. And I don't mean sitting in a museum somewhere. I mean actually still being used, used by humans. Um, and this idea of the inevitable, he's not saying, hey, there's nothing you can do about it. He's saying that there is a, a sweep of history, yes, that there's some you know, tide of history that, that's hard to, to resist, but that we can ultimately control. Like when we're looking at the way that the World Wide Web was built on the internet, which was built on computers, which was built on electricity, which was built on industrialization, you might think, oh, there was an inevitability, that something like, you know, the internet was inevitable, and something like the web was inevitable. And it's true, something like the internet was inevitable, something like the web was inevitable, but not the internet we got, not the web we got. You could go back to 2007 and look at the landscape and say, oh yeah, the iPhone was inevitable. No, no, something like the iPhone was inevitable, not necessarily the iPhone. So this is kind of the point he's making, is that yes, there's, there's a certain amount of inevitability to technology and the sweep of history, but that we ultimately have agency over it. Um, and Kevin Kelly actually spent a lot of time with the Amish, the religious community, and he describes himself as being Amish-ish. Um, because the Amish get this bad rap uh, when it comes to technology. People think that the Amish reject technology, which isn't true. Actually, what they do is they evaluate technology. They take their time and they ask questions of the technology. The Amish are steadily adopting technology at their pace. They are slow geeks. I like that. I like this idea of slow geeks. And I think maybe, you know, when we get overwhelmed by technology, whether it's in the browser or out there in the world, Maybe we could try to be slow geeks. And more importantly, maybe we should just be asking questions. Right? Asking questions of our technology, like how well does it work? Sure, but also how well does it fail? To ask who benefits from this particular technology? And most important of all, to ask what are the assumptions behind the technology? So I'd like you to sort of have those questions in mind when you're hearing about technologies, when you're evaluating technologies. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you build with those technologies. Thank you.